Mad Max was the film that you did first and then Mosquito Coast, right? A year apart or so? Yeah, what happened was I, I did Mad Max um, and then my work on Mosquito Coast was very limited, really. What happened mm. was um, Peter Weir shot it in America, obviously, but, he, but like most Australian directors, they get, the, they get their director's cut. They do it down in Australia away from the studio system and away from any interference, I suppose, perceived interference, just keep to keep clear a clear head. Yeah. And uh, he, I'd finished Mad Max and Peter came to Sydney and he's friendly with George Miller and he needed some help with um, just extra hands. Um, to, and I was brought on to work on the middle part of the movie, which is all the building of the building process. Yep. And, and I only did, I was only on it for about four weeks. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I, I didn't see the finished film actually until I was back in America um, when I was invited to a industry screening of it. And right. um, it was quite a different film from when I left it. It was, I mean, it was just completely different. It was much shorter. It just jumped right into the story instead of seeing um, – what made Harrison Ford's character the way he was? So I thought it yeah. was a, I thought it was a shame to have lost that um, build up to the story and build up to his character. Uh, anyway, that's that's not my not my concern, not my <laughs> business. Yeah, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because I, I don't remember when I saw it, and I vaguely remember the premise. I just remembered it was a very different Harrison Ford film, and then. I watched yes, it, it again, was. and I just watched it again yesterday, and I felt the same way that first he was talking about America is this, America is great, America is this, and then all of a sudden he just had this epiphany, and they pack their bags and just leave the house and leave. And I think right. that from it was very, I, it felt awkward to me too, but I didn't really yeah. pay attention to it too much. There, there was a bit more set up, quite a lot more set up to um, why he made that decision, which I think was a shame to have lost. And um, look, sometimes it comes down to this this mantra the studio hands down. I don't know if this was the case. They usually hand down that like it's got to be X number of minutes long. Yeah. And it's yeah. got to fit into a box so they can fit in all the screenings they need to, which I think has been proven over time to be bogus, you know, like there's lots of films that have been very successful. I mean, Titanic for one, which was like three hours, didn't hurt yeah. the box office at all. So Avatar um, 2, Oppenheimer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think, I think going back to the days when films, I remember people back in the 80s, early 80s, late 70s used to say a feature film should be like no more than 110 minutes. And that was... That was what everybody strived to. So when when somebody came around and released a movie that was two hours long, it was just like, oh, can we handle this? Look, I, I remember when we we tested Harry Potter. I know this is nothing to do with Mosquito Coast. That's fine. That's but, fine. But when we tested, a screen, did our, our preview testing for Harry Potter in Chicago, we went from London to Chicago to test it, was all with mo mostly like 12-year-old kids. And that mm -hmm. movie's two and a half hours long. Not one of those kids moved from their seat. I know they were a captive audience and they they knew what they were going to see, although a lot of them didn't know. It's the way they play it, just come and see a movie. Yeah. Um, but, but they were riveted to it and they would have wanted more because we had to take out some of the book's characters, minor characters, but they would have loved to have seen it all. So I think, I think it's... Um, I've never agreed with that a film has to be X number of minutes long. And it's so true because even I'm not, I'm not even talking about studios now. Like when I was cutting the films, uh, well, I, I wasn't really doing the final cut. I was just doing a draft and then I took it to my editor and we were working on it. And then I wasn't really dealing with studios. I was just literally dealing with um, people who have zero experience with films but are putting money into it. And their first question would be, how long is the film? 
and I'll be like, does it really matter how long it is? And even at the, when we were doing screenings for the film, I was asked by so many different nonprofit organizations, it's 80 minutes is too long. Can you cut it to 50 minutes? I'm like, dude, first of all, it's not like a piece of cake that I just slice it and it's cut. <laughs> You know, yeah. you know, there's so many things and I'm not going to yeah. cut it if you don't want to screen yeah. it. Don't screen it. <laughs> I mean, you, you, I, I, I have said this many times. I've seen incredibly long 90 minute movies. Yeah. Yeah. And, and really explore. Ex seems, I've seen movies that are over two hours and I've not realized it was that because because if the movie's engrossing, the movie's engrossing. Cutting it down yeah. could make it worse because you take no. out explanation you take out setup yeah you're so right and i think that's the thing what again it's i think it's on one of your pet peeves in mind too is like you haven't even seen the film and you have this set time frame that people are not people's attention span is short and yeah it is but if the film is good you know not to toot my own horn but every time i have sort of come across this then they give in and then they watch the film like oh thank you for not listening to us you know, it's like, obviously, I'm not going to listen to you. But that's the thing, I think, in everybody's mindset nowadays. It's not just studio. It's like even audiences, like, how long is the film? Like, my one of my friends, like, how long is Oppenheimer? I'm like, three hours. Like, forget it. I'm not even going to bother. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so that attitude, I think, is just terrible. It is. And and thank goodness for the streaming services now, because I think that is, is like, we have a friend of ours who's an author, and she's trying to get her book um made into a movie and I said I read the book and I went not a movie this is a mini series you need to play this out you know yeah. you don't want a studio saying make it you know 90 minutes long because then it's not going to be your story it's going to be the the beauty of those streaming services you can I mean we're watching some things now that are uh, on I don't know which streaming service it is but it's like three episodes because that's what it needed exactly. and the other things you watch it's eight episodes or 10 episodes or six episodes because it, it's, it's what it needs to tell the story and not ruin it. And um, I think that's the best thing about, I think, about streaming services. Yeah. Agreed. And I think speaking of miniseries, I saw Oppenheimer last night and I felt the same way. I'm like, they should have turned this into a miniseries. I don't know if you have seen it or not. but No, I haven't yet. Yeah, it just, yeah, I'm not going to say anything. I just felt that it should have been, been a miniseries. But anyways... Going back to Mosquito Coast, do you remember what was the setup and his decision making was um, uh, Harrison Ford's character for him to make that decision? Do you remember what that was? You know, I, I don't. I just remember there was a lot more um, of him struggling with living in America. I think that. that yeah, I, I, I mean, it's like it's 30 years That's fine. Ago. That's, that's why I said, do you remember? But, and yeah, been a while. no, no, I don't. But I just remember it was more of, it was more of his, I mean, he was rave, He was kind of like this little raving lunatic by the time he got to, I don't forget where it was supposed to be. It was Belize in actual fact. I don't know where it was in the movie. But um, it was, um, well, it's now known as Honolulu. I think no, not not Honolulu. Sorry, uh, Horin, H Andreas, Andreas. I think Andreas. Uh, Andreas. Yeah. Now it's known as that. I don't know what it was back then, but I looked. Okay. It up, but go on. Yeah. So it, I just know that you know when he got there, he was really kind of crazy and off the off the off the planet because he was so perturbed about him living in America. And there was also there was a lot more of incidences of why he turned into that that character. Yeah, because I, I felt he, you know, when he was in States, you know, he, he seemed actually, it was funny, he seemed very like, you know, patriotic and America's this and America's that, America's great. But then all of a sudden he moved. But one of the things that I, I felt my conclusion was that his character was very, was very self-centered. And the film is literally about what power can do to you. Yeah. You know, when you when you are the only person in charge, you make up your own rules and you go crazy and you know it can it can just drive you bonkers, and which which it does in the film. I mean, it's a, it's an amazing. I think it's one of the Harrison Ford's best movie, like in terms of performance. Yeah, you know, I think um, it is too, and I think it could have been re recognized as that if if it if if you understood, you know, not to go on about it, but if you understood why, yeah, it, it, why that performance is the way it is. 
Let's go to uh, Mad Max. So before Mad Max Beyond Dome, there were two other films that had come out, Mad Max and Mad Max 2, which I haven't seen in a long time. I just saw Mad Max Beyond Dome uh, this morning. Thunderdome. Uh, Thund Thunderdome, sorry. Beyond Thunderdome. My apologies. Um, how did you get on board uh, with working with George Miller, aside from the element of, I think he's from Australia, right, George Miller? Yes, he is. Or, yeah, aside yeah. from being an Aussie. There's two George Millers in Australia that are film directors, which is very confusing. But Whoa. the one I, yeah, there's one who did, um, his most famous film was The Man from Snowy River. And okay. um, George, the George I work for, the famous one, <laughs> everyone knows, um, used to be a doctor, medical doctor. So he was, um, he's always referred to as Dr. George. And I came on, I, I, I was working at the ABC in, in Australia, which is like our version of the BBC based on yeah. the same, same yeah. uh, principles of setup. Um, and I was, I did a, a mini series uh, with a director called Carl Schultz. And then mm. Carl Schultz, um, left the, he was freelance i was still working at abc i left the abc to do a movie with him and then he was employed to do two or three episodes of a mini series the first mini series that george miller's company george and his partner at that time byron kennedy mm -hmm. uh, they formed a production company and made the mini series called the, Dis the dismissal which was a political drama and carla uh, recommended me to the because of my TV background and doing mm -hmm. TV drama, recommended me. So I came on and, and worked on three episodes of that. I think it was three. I think I, I know I had to take over another one. Maybe I did four. I don't remember. And George directed one of those as well as producing. And then Mad Max was, uh, Mad Max Beyond Thunder and was in the works. And as they were in pre-production, they asked me to come on board. And originally, there was going to be several editors. Like mm -hmm. there were several editors through Road Warrior, Mad mm -hmm. Max 2. Mm -hmm. Certain editors worked on certain sections, like the montage stuff was done by somebody else and the drama was somewhere. And so they thought that was the way it should work. And I went, well, why don't we just start off? Because I've done these things on my own before. Let's just start off and see if, if, you, if you think you need uh, anybody else to be brought on. Anyway, nobody, we didn't bring anybody else on. Mm -hmm. Then George went off to America to do um, an episode of The Twilight Zone, and then right. after the, which I, I obviously I didn't do, but then he was offered The Witches of Eastwick, and he asked me to go to and do it. So we bundled up my wife and the two kids, and we went to America for about a year to do that. Mm. So um, that's how it started, and then you know. I did Lorenzo's Oil and I did um, Dead Calm, which George produced. Uh, and that's the, way, that's the way it goes, you know. Lucky I, break. Right place, yeah, right time. It, well, true, for sure. And I never knew that he was a doctor, first of all. I mean, that's that's the interesting yeah. thing because because it's not just that he's a filmmaker. I mean, you look at his filmography, like all the Mad Max films, and you have Babe... Uh, you know, then then you have uh, what's that penguin movie? Um, Happy, Happy Feet, Feet, right? And uh, yeah, like he's just been all over the map. And and uh, when I was watching Mad Max today, and I was trying to under, it, it was first of all, you know, the the way it was shot was phenomenal, um, even for today's time. But just putting myself in the eighties, the environment that they were in, even the cuts, like especially that action sequence, uh, the fight sequence they had in that in that um, dome when everybody was sort oh, of yeah. hanging out and watching it. Like, you know, you look at it from today's point of view, it seems great. But if you put yourself back in the 80s, I mean, back then, seeing an actor of Mel Gibson caliber, uh, I mean, he was a star at the time. You know, he had done Mad yes. Max films. He was doing Lethal, Lethal Weapon. To, to sort of string himself with that and then just kind of go back and forth... I, I thought it was, I mean, aside from the film, just talking about that sequence, that, that was such a remarkable sequence, and it goes on. Every time I thought he has, he's got the guy, 
he loses the weapon, then he grabs another one. It just, you know, it was so unpredictable and it worked really, really well. Yeah. That was one of the most enjoyable scenes to cut, actually. And it's funny, so just a little thing about it is uh, when they're attached to those bungee cords, when he's attached and he's springing around, of course, mm -hmm. they had a stuntman do all the dangerous stuff. Mm -hmm. And it, I couldn't use much of the stuntman stuff because he was so bad. Because <laughs> a, lot of a lot of stuntmen don't act. Yeah. They just do the stunt. They go, oh, I've got to do this and this. So they do it. There's no acting involved. But Mel, when Mel did it, he was acting. So I used most of his stuff. It was better than the stuntman stuff. I was going to say, when you said there was a stuntman, I'm like, all the shit, because I was trying to keep an eye on that. And I mean, majority of the stuff that I saw, I saw Mel in it. And yeah, I mean, at that I time, I, there was no, yeah. Yeah, he's a bit like, um, he's a bit like, um, Tom Cruise, he, he, he's good at doing, I mean, Tom Cruise is just insane what he does, um, but <laughs> he's fantastic at selling the stunt, you know, selling the action. Having, right. Having had the pleasure to do that. So it's, uh, it's great. When you, you and I talked about Shawshank and Green Mile and on those films, you were more or less on the set, you know, do, going through dailies. Was it something similar in this at, or you came in when everything was done in terms of production. oh no I, I i was on from day one and they a lot of the a lot of the shooting on um on mad max was done out in uh, broken hill which is out in the middle of australia and i was in sydney so yeah. they they'd send the dailies to me um but i'd only be like a day or two behind and then those days we were cutting on film right so mm. it was physical no avids no linear non-linear editing system it was all physical film at work and so i'd be working back at base and then sending notes to 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 george you know like i don't have this or i i, I can you do this can you do that and not much just a couple of times if i didn't didn't find i didn't think i had enough sh coverage to finish a scene um anyway uh yeah so i'm it's it's very normal that you're on from the very first day of shooting. Right. And what was the experience like working with George? Even I I know you had worked with him previously, but just on a feature film. Well, that like was the first that. Feature, that was the first time I'd worked with him. So, I mean, yeah. it was great. It was great. We would. I mean, George is one of those edit, uh, directors who likes to be present in the cutting room during the fine cut stage. Like I'd put it together and show it, show it to him. Mm -hmm. And then we'd go through and do all the nitty gritty stuff, like show me all the other takes on this that you used, just to make sure if you preferred a different performance. So we would do that. And um, that's, that's not necessarily the way a lot of directors like to work. A lot of directors will go, let's have a look at a reel, 10 minutes in those days. And then I'll give you my notes and then I'll go away and then you do the notes and I'll come back. They don't want to sit there while you go through, especially in those days when it was so laborious to do a change. They yeah. would, a lot of them just would go nuts. Go, I can't stand sitting around here while you try, you try and find that extra frame that you can't find because that's in an envelope on top of the uh, editing machine and it's all filed away. Um, yeah, but he he liked to be there for that. He could he could he could just sit there and zone out and be thinking about some ideas while I'm doing it. So, right. And I'm fine. I'm fine with it either way. I can work either way. I have no problem with it. What was the most difficult scene to cut? Um, I mean, we you already talked about what you enjoyed the most, but was there a scene that? you couldn't wrap your finger around uh, during the editing process and then it later it kind of came to fruition? No, I don't think so on that, on that one. Um, just trying to think w whether that we had a written end for that script. Uh, I think we did. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we go into these things we don't know how it's going to end. <laughs> yeah, it still yeah. is like that. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, it's more so with... Uh, those types of films. No, I don't think so. I think they were all challenging. I mean, they're all challenging to the action scenes are always challenging because they're usually shot in such little pieces sometimes, you know, they're not, you know, it's, 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 it's laborious um, for them. 
Uh, sometimes only you only get a handful of shots a day, especially if they're out in the middle of nowhere shooting, and yeah. they um, they have to do a long run up with a car. I mean, I remember once there was a a shot that was like ten minutes long, and I went, "Why is this ten minutes long?" It was attached mm -hmm. um, remote camera to the side of one of those vehicles that are racing along in the desert, and they mm -hmm. did the shot. And then somebody forgot to turn the camera off. So the rest of it was them driving back to base. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, um, yeah, but that just shows you how, how long it takes to get a shot out there sometimes yeah. on those films. Especially with all those vehicles, you know, racing in the desert, and they've got to coordinate them all and they, they you know, set them all up. It takes so long. And then they, if they've got to do another take, they've got to send them all back and around and back over the horizon and then come back. You know, it's just tedious. Right. One thing I, I, I and maybe this is, this is just me, when I think it was halfway into the film when Max Mel Gibson's character um, is surrounded, is hanging upside down and surrounded by the kids. And, right. and that scene to me and their wardrobe I'm like, where have I seen this before? Like, it just rang some sort of a bell. And then it hit me. Now, I don't know if this was intentional or not, or it was just me looking into it too much. In um, Steven Spielberg's Hook, The Lost Boys. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I, I've, I'm i like, that. It, it it just felt like that in terms of their wardrobe, in terms of the but way isn't the that kids after? Yeah, Hook came afterwards. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I think, yeah. a, I, I think a lot of people, a lot of filmmakers, Mad Max set the standard for certain, for like yeah. grunginess and the vehicles, you know, this out of work utopian, uh, not utopian, dystopian um, landscape and with vehicles that don't look like they should be able to run, you know, rusty old, bashed up vehicles. That set the stage for a lot of what came, you know. It's it a bit did. like with um, it's a bit like with the opening title credits of Seven. How after yes. that people people started like I, I think Down Came a Spider or whatever it was called copied it you know very much afterwards that raw raw kind of um, style of yeah just it, weird raw stuff you know very raw camera angles and no weird. for sure. And, and you know, credit to George, but obviously to you as well. Again, we talked about this during Sean Shank and Green Mile podcast, is that the, the, it was just the way George George films, it's the old school, obviously, like because he likes to, you know, he likes to build his set so he can move the camera around in whatever way he wants so he, the audience feels and knows where they are so they can be there. And it just makes things so much easier easier maybe and correct me if i'm wrong for the editor because you don't need to necessarily cut like you know the shot the scene but with when he's introduced to tina turner's character you know there was there was hardly any cuts at least you know aside from the punching and this pushing down and stuff and it makes it so intriguing and interesting and i'm watching it and i'm like you know those kind of films are so much missed and that's one thing uh, when i saw oppenheimer last night i i didn't like it was just there were ridiculous amount of cuts like way too many and it just becomes so distracting so kudos to you for you know for keep, yeah, keeping I mean, it I'm, that way I, I, yeah I'm a great one I mean I I'll hang on to a shot and if I think it's telling the story I'll go what, why do I cut why do I need to cut yeah. you know I mean I was always told as a young editor or a young assistant that the lessons you learn and the things that stick in your mind is make sure there's a cut is always a motivated one. There's a reason for it. Don't just, I mean, I know what you mean. And, and, and maybe that's the reason I don't want to go and see Oppenheimer. I didn't know that was over, overcut, but that, that. I felt that it could, I could be wrong. I mean, that's what there I was. A, there was a great little thing I saw on, on YouTube a while ago, uh, this, I don't even know who what his name is now, but there's a guy who analyzes edits. Right, you mentioned that. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, and he analyzed the one from um, Bohemian Rhapsody, but, and it was just a simple dialogue scene, but it was so overcut. And he, I, this guy went I through. I saw that. Did, wasn't that amazing? I mean, it was so well explained to to a non-editorial person. 
to understand what we do because it's the hardest job I ever have is explaining to people what I do for a living or what I did for a living. Yeah. Um, what an editor does because people, Don't which get we it. as a group, we as a group in America, especially the American cinema editors are always trying to educate the public by whatever means we can. I mean, the reason I do these things is, hopefully that I'm somehow going to educate people who don't know what this craft is all about. Yeah. Uh, giving my perspective on it anyway. But um, it's, it's like trying to, <coughs> trying to describe oxygen, you know, it's like, it's there, you know, I don't know why it's there, but we need it. Um, it's the only, I don't know if you told me this, but it's the only art form that is unique to film. Hmm. Everything else, camera and lighting and all that, all that kind of stuff you could relate to, to the stage, you know, costume, yeah. makeup, special effects, everything. All stage plays have had special effects in them, even if it's just a puff of smoke or something, but they've had it there forever. Music has been in stage plays. So really editing is the only craft unique to movie making. And, um, Maybe for that reason, it's still a bit of a mystery to the general public. It It is. And I actually felt when, well, it's been a while now, you know, with, with the online YouTube and TikTok and all that stuff generation, um, you know, you can edit stuff on the phone and all that. And I literally thought, not that you can compare editing on the phone with the Avid or film uh, cutting film, I thought maybe people will get a little bit of grasp on it, but it's not even films. Any kind of editing, people just do not get it. Now, there's a flip side to it. When there's tons, okay, maybe I shouldn't say tons, when there's a big number of editing that is really, really bad, um, whatever it is, whether it's film, commercial, it maybe that plays into people's psyche, but going back to your example of uh, that film, I saw that scene and after I saw him explaining it, then I kind of just watched it again and I just, you know, put the mute button on and I'm watching it and it's cutting so abruptly and it's cut and it's the angles are off the coverage. Like it was just so bizarre. And this movie won the Oscar or was it nominated? I don't even remember now. <laughs> yeah. It was, no, it won the Oscar. And, he, the and Oscar. What's, what is amazing, John Ottman, the editor, has has been quoted as saying, "I don't think I deserved it." <laughs> you know, the the cutting in that he he himself doesn't like what he did. Now, whether that means he was kind of forced to do it, possibly. Um, I mean, I've been in a situation where a director said, "Put more cuts in there," and I've gone, "Okay, I'll try it." But you know, you can't force it, and and that that's a perfect example of if you force it, you will ruin it. And going back to your original uh, comment about you know, hanging on to shots, that, that's, I mean, that's what it's all about, you it, know. So it it's is. like knowing when to do that only comes from the experience, I think. For I sure. mean, I see the, I see a lot of stuff on TV now and I go, I, I swear it looked like the, the scene was edited by a, a bot. You know, it was, I don't think anybody could have really done a worse job unless they were trying to do it. <laughs> Yeah. And I and I, I think it comes from experience. One thing that I really I mean you you talked about there has to be a motive for cut. So this I was conscious about this when I saw the opening of Mad Max and you, there's a shot, I think it's a second shot or third shot when um Mel Gibson's character the ca he's coming towards the camera. He passes by the camera. The camera follows him and the plane goes over the camera. And he keeps walking and walking and walking in that shot and he's disappearing into the shot and then it cuts to his feet and then th okay what's the motive there like you said the motive is that he finds these shoes that's when you cut aside instead of showing his feet for at least another 20 seconds you know with the shoes sitting in the distant back i think the wider shot spoke so much because it explains so much about his character and who he is as opposed to showing yeah. his feet and looking for shoes and, and 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 isn't it a little bit more intriguing too to go? Well, of why is he walking? And then you go, oh, I, that's that's why he's walking. You know, 
it's yeah, the opposite keeps... of uh, it's the opposite of what Hitchcock used to do. You know, instead of showing someone walking and then they slip on a banana peel, he'd show the banana peel. Then they're walking, and so the audience goes, "Uh oh, he's going to slip," and he does slip. So he he sets it up differently, but that's completely different style. That's that's you know the horror style. Yeah, no, it 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 uh, Mad Max three was a great film visually um uh, performance wise and and that's what you know when i i saw the charlie's theron one and i think george miller is working on another one according to imdb um uh, two. two more okay i think there's and, one uh, fruit furiosa and mm-hmm. uh wasteland i think i think he's yeah I think he's wasteland. Shot on both well furiosa is in post-production i think wasteland might be in production i'm not sure So when I saw the Charlize and Tom uh, Charlize Theron and Tom H- Hardy version that itself was very very amazing like you know because I hadn't seen Mad Max for a long time so see in that kind of environment with those kind of vehicles with you know I've talked about this over and over again to so many people on this podcast including podcast including yourself like the wider shots I think he uses a lot of 28 mm or 35 mm or maybe even 24 mm lenses but then when I saw this one keeping in mind 1986 and obviously in production in 1984 i mean it's a whole different ball game like you know you're looking at limited resources you're looking at film there's not digital and no, all the no, extra you know visual effects wise um i mean the very end of the film where they're flying through sydney harbor with the harbor that's just that's a model you know like there's no there's no there's no cg didn't exist you know i mean i remember there's there's a there's a shot in the desert when the vehicles are a side shot of all the vehicles driving mm-hmm. and you could see because there's no door on these vehicles you could see the stunt man had a seat belt on a mm. lap belt and um we thought how are we going to eliminate that how are we going to eliminate that and i I went over to the lab to talk to the um to the optical effects department and this guy came out with this genius idea Roger Callan, his name was. I don't know if he's alive anymore. He said, look, we're going to distract from it. And I said, well, how do you do that? He says, well, if I put a little glint, because we could do such limited things, he said, I can put a little glint, just like a, a reflection thing, mm. at that frame. It was only a frame or two, but it's amazing what the eye picked up. And he did it, and it just it distracted you from looking there. It was the most genius idea, just... There was a sort of like a little sun reflection off, off that surprisingly off the area where the belt buckle was, mm. and for that reason, it just it looked so real. It just looked like the sun reflecting, and it was a couple of frames long. And it, and it, that's the way we used to have to hide things that that shouldn't be there. You know, not like can't paint anything out. It would have been <laughs> would have been too too time consuming. You know, it's funny you mentioned that and. and the way things are going with technology and ai you know the the era of cgi or special effects will be talked about as we are talking about what used to be before era of cgi you yeah. know because ai has become so like it's just so crazy the things that are coming out i mean it's frightening actually you know we're living in an era sure it has benefits but we're living in an era where we won't even know what's true and what's not. Like I was just watching this podcast um of someone uh do you, I don't know if you know Joe Rogan, he's a pretty big podcaster. Oh yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so he was talking about and I I've listened to his stuff and he was talking about somebody and he was saying this guy I went with and he was looking at uh adult magazines and this and that and that and this and I'm thinking to myself it doesn't seem like the way he would talk and then i watched it again and i looked at the comments it was ai and it was so freaking real like the lip movement the face ev- it wasn't even audio it was everything and it's scary yeah. as hell you know when you see stuff like that like somebody can put your stuff out uh, what you say make it up and put it online and god well, knows what happens and that that's a deep fake too like yeah, what they can yeah. do with deep fake I mean that guy that Bill Hader is it the comedian uh, I've seen him do interviews where that he talks like Tom does an impersonation of Tom Cruise yeah. and at the same time his face changes into Tom Cruise 
Yeah. It's uh, unbelievable what they can do. Yeah, it's, it's, very clear. Very clear. Uh, I, I, found, I found a lot of those those um, AI things though. I don't know if they've. You, if I haven't seen one of them, like the Joe Rogan one, but what I what I had seen was it looked out, it looked good until they blinked, and then the blink looked really weird. They could. It, it, it was more like a, it, 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 but it, a, your eye doesn't blink so mechanically. It's yeah. a little. So, it closes a little bit. You know, it's a little softer. And I don't know. They must have got that worked out because if you couldn't tell, I mean, it was a dead giveaway that no one would realize. No one would not be um, able to tell that it was yeah. fake. And uh, that uh, did you see the most recent Indiana Jones? No. Okay. I, I, I so, read all the re so many reviews that I thought, oh, I don't think I want to do this. Yeah, it's not a good film. I didn't like it at all. Um, but the opening was the first 20 minutes. I mean, the younger version of Harrison Ford, it was all shot during night. And even in the, and I, I figured why they did it at night because you can, you could hide the, the, the details of, uh, of his facial expression, but still it just, it wasn't there. Like, but at the same time, the scary part is we're in the early stages of AI or deep fake. So, you know, when it becomes really rock solid, then God knows what happens next. But, you know, you see it in films like I, Indiana Jones, aside from the problems it had, like that, that was, I've seen people converting uh, Harrison Ford's, the trailers of the new film into using a cheap software by themselves. And it looks a lot better than what Lucasfilm and Paramount and Disney did. Like it's oh. just it's it's. <laughs> I mean, I've seen that example with Irishmen. Uh, w I think that was the very first time they did it when they made Al Pacino and De Niro look younger. And right. there's access to softwares out there for you know young guys who would just do it, and it would be so much better than what Hollywood is doing. I, I have no idea why that is. Wow, that is kind of scary too. It it is scary. Yeah, it is scary. Yeah. Um. But uh, but yeah, no kudos on Mad Max. Uh, you know, and I I want to talk a little bit about Mosquito Coast, even though you know you worked on it for four weeks, just a tad bit. Uh, I know it's been a long time, so we don't necessarily need to talk about the aesthetics and the editing and all that stuff. But just in the film itself, um, you know how it the the element of the but the part where there's a pastor and then how he sort of comes back at the end and what happens at the end. For you, aside from that setup that was taken out, what was the message that you drive home as an audience member after watching that film? I, I really, I, I don't, I've got an answer to that. It's really so long ago. I don't remember. You don't much remember about the watching, that Okay. I don't no remember worries. much about that movie. I know this whole podcast is supposed to be about that and Mad Max. No but, worries. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I well, yeah, we'll skip the, the, we'll, the older you get, the worse it gets. That's fine. What, let's talk. Let's talk about something that you do remember recently that you did. I leave that up to you. Which which film do you is most in memory that you would love to chat about right now for the next ten fifteen minutes? Well, actually, I I, I think an underrated movie was uh, Oblivion. I mean, um, do you see Oblivion? The Tom Cruise one. Yeah. You edited that? Yeah. Oh God, that's an amazing film. I didn't. I somehow I missed that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I love. I love that film. I mean, I think. It, it, um, I think it was an exceptionally good-looking film. I mean, um, the 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 technology they they brought to to it to shoot that whole house up on the tower, you know, the apartment where he lived. Yeah, you know um, that was a. I mean, they talked about doing that with green screen outside the windows, but they ended up using front projection. So mm. all that out there was projected, but the set was raised. The projectors were under the raised section, point, multiple projectors pointing, so they could shoot 180 degrees, and. But the amount of light they could get onto those was minimal. So they had to therefore bring down the lighting in the practical set. And I tell you, you walk onto the set 
and it was like the darkest set I've ever been on. And mm. you shooting for day, and you, you you think how can this possibly work? And you look at the monitor, and it, there it is. Looks like daytime. You just open the, the lenses up, and uh, digital. You couldn't have shot it on film. But I also think, I um, mean, I was very proud of my work on that. I I had a lot of fun on it. Uh, and, but I'm, I'm amazed at how many people uh, didn't like it. They just don't like the, they, they didn't, they th couldn't understand the end of it. They couldn't understand that there were multiple jacks in different parts of the, the space that the movie was shot in. Multiple jacks and multiple vicars, in, all with different name numbers on here. He was 45 and there were others. Hmm you know, different, well, 54, I can't remember what he was now. But people at the end of the movie were going, like, how can he, huh? he's still alive? How can that be? And that kind of clouded it for everybody. But I enjoyed it. No. I enjoyed it. No, it was actually, it's one of Tom Cruise. I mean, Tom Cruise has done incredible stuff throughout his life. But, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's, it was a very different film for him. And, you know, work with, working with the director, um, Joseph, who also did Tron Legacy and, yeah. most recent Top Gun. What was working with him like? And I know Tom Cruise, I don't know if he was a producer on this film, uh, Oblivion. I'm no, he guessing wasn't. He, he wasn't. Was he, were they both involved in post-production in any oh, way? Yeah. Do um, talk about that. Tom was very involved. He, I, I, I think because he's Tom Cruise and he says to the director, I'd like to come in and see what you're doing in the cutting room. No one's going to say no. Keep your yeah. out. So yeah. we, he came. He came in, and um, he was great. You know, he just wanted to. He wanted to be involved. He wanted to, you know, give some ideas. I, I don't remember him ever having any problems with anything. I mean, he did want to reshoot a scene he thought he wasn't very good in, but we were fine with it. We actually never reshot anything on that film, which is unusual these days. Um, nothing. Nothing was reshot. Um, and Joe Joe Kaczynski was. Terrific to work for. Um, very talented guy, very savvy, very smart, very technically smart, but also, um, which was impressive enough, but um, just very smart from, um, you know, it's okay. A lot of people can be technically good, but not good with um, storytelling mm. and good with performance, understanding performance and what he, he knew what he wanted. He, you know, he got what he wanted, um, and you know, it's not. I wouldn't say it's not handling that. He was good at handling Tom Cruise. He didn't need any handling, but dealing dealing with 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 him. It's I an mean, art. Well, he's not. <laughs> Tom was not a. I mean, you think of him as a prima donna. Furthest from from it. He was in, incredibly enthusiastic. Yeah. He would come onto the set and he'd go, Love, he'd go, come on, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. I'm ready, I'm ready. And, you know, do his own stunts and, you know, ama he was amazing. Um, I can't say enough good things about him. Um, well, well, he talks about that how he, and which I think is true, I, I, I feel it's true, he talks about over and over again that how he just loves every facet of cinema he wants to learn every department like what does the costume does what does the editor does what does the cinematographer does the lighting the lenses i mean it, he's truly like a film buff i mean you see that in his excitement at least Ooh. from what i can tell right yeah um, amazingly place, it, yeah he's amazingly enthusiastic and so it, it kind of infectious you know um and hard working my god he's really hard working it's good to see, you know, like he'd never be late on set. He wouldn't ever throw any of those kind of prima donna, <laughs> those prima donna things like keeping the set, the crew waiting. He was the opposite. He was like driving them. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Well, I think no, that's I, the, I think the right word to use is infectious because working with somebody like that, even if you don't like them for them picking you up early or whatever, it just wears on people and then it just multiplies and, you know, top down approach and everybody gets excited and energetic about it. Um, was on this film, was there a stunt that he did himself, obviously, which he did that was very dangerous um, that you 
perhaps I think were... the... wait, wait, what? Perhaps you were on the set um, when you when you witnessed it when you were doing any kind of dailies, or you were not on the set of, uh, for Oblivion. Oh, you know, there was a lot of it was being shot. We shot it in um, Baton Rouge, the mm -hmm. studio down there, and so I was cutting very close to the studio. Mm -hmm. um, so I would go to the set every now and again, either to see the director or something, or just I had time, so I'd go and. I used to like and go and watch, but I never like staying too long because it's like so slow compared yeah. to, I mean, <laughs> you've got to remember, I get the dailies that they shot the day before. I get them all in one go. They're boom. There they are. I have access to every shot. So I can be instantly gratified by going, well, where's the close-up? Where's that? But if you're on the set, they do the master. And by the time they do all the other coverage, this could take, you know, half a day. Yeah. So I'm, I, I just don't have the patience to hang around. Um, but I, I, no, I don't, I was never there for any of his stunts, but, um, I was there for some, but not really dangerous. The gimbal work when they're doing mm -hmm. the drone, the drone chase, uh, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, they're spinning around in this, this thing that was pretty hair raising, but the, I think that the most dangerous stunt he did was, um, when he drops, when he's going down, being lowered down or he's lowering himself down into the library and he drops. Mm. I mean, he did those falls. There's no stuntman involved in that. I mean, there's several cuts in it, but, you know, he landed and rolled and uh, he did all that um, and sold it very convincingly as being painful. Maybe it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, possibly it was. I mean, he broke his uh, foot or part of his foot when he did, I think, the fallout, Mission Impossible Fallout, which was number six. <laughs> Yeah, when he jumped uh, across the building and yeah. landed against the side of it. Um, yeah, he didn't do anything dangerous in this one. He did bike jumps and things like that. The, no, nothing super, super dangerous. Working with Joseph, um, I mean, it was a great experience. But what was one? Th you mentioned it, but I'm just trying to find. I'm just trying to find the right word for this question. I mean, I love Tron. Right, and I love Top Gun Maverick, uh, both kind of like uh, established brands from the eighties. Um, how does he? You said something about him working with the actors and stuff, which is really what a good director should do. Based on what you saw, it, what was that one thing that came across to you that how he tackled actors in terms of putting them in their character or making them comfortable. I mean, Tom Cruise doesn't need anything, you know, in terms of being comfortable. No. I, I think, well, I think his biggest attribute was his patience mm. with these, with people, generally speaking, he was, he would never get, he would never get, he was very even keeled. And I think from an acting actor's point of view, that puts them under less pressure mm -hmm. and they, they give their best because they're not being like hounded by, you know, they're not like, not like Michael Bay, you know, who's probably yelling at them, you know, <laughs> to do something, you know, um, that's his style. It works for him. He gets away with it, but um, he was just very, I thought I was always impressed with how cool headed he was and he would listen and, um, Take, take on board what the actor says and then get them to do it the way he wanted and maybe he'd get them to have a go at doing it the way they want. But it was, he, 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 there wasn't a lot of um, wasted time mm -hmm. as far as what I could see. It was very, very well planned out, which was another reason I think that we never had to reshoot anything. Uh, that's a, a great tribute to him. And that was only his second film, you know. Yeah, yeah. He, I, I mean, he'd be a lot more. Lot, he'd probably be a lot better now. Same. I'm sure he's the same person, but I don't think it's not the type of thing that goes to his. He didn't feel ever feel the kind of like the kind of guy that put on any airs or graces, you know. Well, that's what I was. Uh, I was reading about uh, Top Gun Maverick that how. Uh, Tom Cruise had been interested in doing a sequel for a long time, right? For whatever he was going to, he was going to do it with Tony Scott too. Yeah, exactly with Tony Scott, and then he passed away, 
And then he said that I was in Paris or in UK and I got a call from Bruckheimer or somebody that Joseph wants to present, you know, the story of Top Gun 2. And he said, you know, Joseph came with a with a with a deck of some sort and literally had everything broken down in terms of what the film would be. And that was it. Like he said, I saw that and I'm like, this is it. We're going to do this. So yeah. it goes back to what you were saying, like he's so prepared and oh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, what I mean, you I, have to be do. Oh, it was so far in advance. Like I think I had, and I can't remember the last time or if it ever happened, I was employed six months, five or six months before they started principal photography. That's, wow, that's really that's un really unheard cool. of. It's usually yeah. like sometimes it's days. Like I think I had a, I, I was, I think I was given a script for, seven on Wednesday and they were starting to shoot the following Monday. <laughs> uh, that's probably the closest I've ever had to, you know, to start a principal photography that I was on board. But, um, and w even when I was uh, first read the script and I had to go into Disney and um, Disney. Miramax seven was Miramax, which was bought by. No, Disney, no, yeah. no. I'm talking, I'm talking about um, oblivion now. So oh, okay. I'm going back to oblivion. Oblivion no, it was it was no, universal. It wasn't Disney. It was probably it was universal. universal. Yeah. But I think he was uh, anyway. Where I went to see him, he was on the Disney lot. I think. Anyway, I went to see him. Um, well, to read the script, I had to go into the office. They wouldn't even send it to me, right? They, had, mm. they put me in a room, and I read. I read it, and then I was employed. And from the moment I was on the film, I started was sent um, previsors of action scenes, like the drone fight and all that. And it was already planned out. It was already planned out six months in before they started shooting. And that was the same with everything. Everything was like given to us. So we knew what we were going to get way in advance. Nothing was ever like last minute. It was so well organized. It was a pleasure to work on. Yeah. It's, it's always nice when you walk into something and you go, it, everybody's got their act together, you know? Yeah. Well, if you look at Joseph's film, Tron, Oblivion, and Top Gun, if you really pay attention to them, they're very similar. You know, all of them are very, like, mobile-based, like, you know, plane and then yes. motorbikes and then, you know, helicopter or, you know, Oblivion. Like, it's, and, he, and they're very crisp and clean, and I really uh, admire that about him and his, his patience. And you mentioned Michael Bay. It's funny. I was talking to John Schwartzman. Uh, a while ago and I, oh, I yeah. was asked and I was asking him so how you know because they were friends from childhood Michael Bay and him I'm like so you did The Rock you did Armageddon you did Pearl Harbor how come you know you didn't continue well he goes for one reason it was like I didn't want to do the same thing over and over again but the second the most important reason was he was always yelling and I couldn't take it so I'm like see you later Michael I gotta go I can't deal with it I mean but yeah that's that's the type everybody knows how Michael Bay is and I think he doesn't care anyway <laughs> that's his trademark you know he doesn't yeah. care you know yeah but he's uh, so no. funny because he's he's a, he's actually quite a sweet guy when you get him out of work you know I I'm sure oh, I'm sure yeah anyway <laughs> it's another story. <laughs> yeah. Um, great. Thank you so much, Richard, for your time. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, sorry I put you on for Mosquito Coast, and I hope that didn't uh, uh, affect your... Uh, no, <laughs> that's all right. That's, a, that's okay. But, I'm sorry uh, I couldn't give you more information, but, you know, it's, it's. I suppose when you live with a film for, you know, a longer time than I did, you can remember more about it. I was basically, basically with blinkers on just doing that section of the movie for so long. Well, so. I, I am going to be talking to John Seal soon about Mosquito Coast, so I'll get all the juicy information from him. You will. <laughs> you will. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, again, this has been very educational as always. It's a fantastic and super pleasure of mine to speak to you and uh, would love to continue doing this down the road. As Absolutely. Any, any time. Perfect. Thank you so much, Richard. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you so much for watching and listening. Don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. And do come back for another episode. Until then, have a great day.